and they stand in God's presence, church. He said to the Lord, he 
He said, one day he said, have you heard from God? And the prophet replied, yeah, you're going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Hearing from God ain't always nice. Yeah. But it is always best. Yeah. It wasn't nice for that man to hear that he was going to die. Oh, but it was best because it helped that man get his house in order. Yeah. And I believe tonight, whether it's me or somebody else in this pulpit, or whether it's one of you out there in the crowd tonight, God's got here who He wants to be here. And I believe tonight He's wanting us to get our house in order. And I know automatically we're going to have those that's religious that's going to say, well, my house is in order and my house is good and I'm, I'm saved and I'm right. Well, praise God. Pray for the one that's beside you because they might not be. Amen. I was with Pastor Timmy Wednesday up at Brother Todd's church, and it just so happened that I didn't have to work, and I got to go to church. Robert Hunt was leading service, and he asked me to sing, and I didn't have a song, so he asked me to testify. And I stood and I testified in the church of the Holler. Brother Bud, he was there, and then, you know, I testified. Clayton asked me a few weeks ago, God's gave me this sermon. And when he gave me this sermon, I was on the internet, and I was on YouTube, and I was watching about Brownsville Revival. And uh, I don't know how many of you in here knows who or what Brownsville Revival is, but uh, Brownsville Revival is a thing that took place in 1995. It actually lasted for about five or six years. It took place in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, there was a man that come along that was just supposed to preach a one day service on Father's Day. He was supposed to preach a morning service at this church in Pensacola. And uh, they say that the Spirit of God come in that place so thick and so strong, Brother Hunter, that the pastor of the church realized it. He told the man of God, he said, cancel your appointment for the evening, cancel your appointment for tomorrow. We got to go on with this thing. And they say that, you know, that we in the... When, when they come back that Sunday night, they say that the service was just as thick and, 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 and as, as real as what the first service was. Yeah. And so they went out went out by a night by night thing. And, and night by night people came and night by night people gave their life to the Lord, Brother Clayton Bell. And uh, for five, six years this revival went on. People from all around the world come. People were saved. They were healed. They were delivered. And, uh, and I'm talking about Brownsville Revival tonight because I've heard the pastor talk about how the, we need revival. I've heard other preachers talk about how the, we need revival. Well, the reality is in America, the last big revival was Brownsville Revival. There ain't been a revival like that since in America. And I'm going to tell you, church, the way that we're going to get Brownsville Revival to happen again, the way we're going to get revival to happen again in our life, we got to get real with God, Pastor Timmy. we got to quit putting on the facade, and we got to quit putting on the act, and we got to get down to where the rubber meets the road and tell the Lord that, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm serious about this thing. There ain't no more playing around. There ain't time to play around. All we got to do is look at the ball today and see what it's like. Church, and 
day. The, the church that was asking Charles Finney to come and preach to them uh, didn't have a pastor. The pastor had left. They, they, the, most of the members had left. Those that was left was fighting amongst one another. And they was at the point of disbanding. And everybody that was within that church was getting ready to go into the other churches. And uh, Charles Finney got word of this. And when he got word and he got the request to come and preach there, he just automatically said no because of all the conflict. And the Lord went and he disturbed Charles Finney in his sleep as he went to sleep that night. And uh, Char Charles Finney recorded the word saying that the Lord told him for all the reasons that you're saying you can't go to preach a revival. He said it's all the reasons that you need to go to preach a revival. So the next day he got up and, and he went about his way. He got his family and his friends together and he said we're going to Rochester, New York. And Charles Finney had a way of doing things when he went in to hold revivals. He went in and he always sent two men ahead of him. And these two men went ahead of him into, into Rochester and they got a hotel room and, and for five days they laid in the hotel room laid out prostrate on the ground crying, weeping, well, moaning, crying unto the Lord saying God send revival to Rochester. God you see the people's request. You see the people's uh, uh, want for revival want for a stir soul of revival. God sent it to them. Sent them. They cried for the, on the behalf of the people. They cried for the people. And all of a sudden Charles Finley comes up in there and six months later the revival ends. A hundred thousand people gave their life to God. Bars shut down. They say that even today that the lowest of the crime rate, crime rate has ever been in Rochester, New York was during the six months that Charles Finney yes. was holding revival. Yes, Think about it. 100,000 people in six months got saved. Well, what would we do if 100,000 people got saved here? Oh, that ain't possible, brother. Sean, we're not big enough. Don't get me wrong. Don't get God wrong. With God, all things are possible. Right. Amen. Amen. Keep it sealer. It's like the old saying, Bill, that they'll come. Amen. You fast forward a few years after Charles Finney, you get to 1906, 1916, somewhere through there, and you'll read about what they call the Azusa Street Revivals down in California. And we've heard, we've heard people talk about that here in the church, so we won't spend much time on that. But much like in the Charles Finney thing, the Charles Finney Revival was considered the first great awakening. The Azusa Street Revival was considered the great second great awakening, amen, and uh, it was at the Azusa Street Revival that, that arms and limbs would grow back out of sockets that was cut off, amen, and people were saved, healed, delivered, just manifestations of the Holy Ghost, all because four or five little black people got together one day and decided they wanted to see a move of God, Pastor Timmy, and they got together and they got praying, and then all of a sudden the fire came, Brother Sam, when the fire came, revival came. There are reports throughout in Azusa that the local fire department had responded a hundred and some odd times to the church thinking that it was on fire. People reported that it was on fire when actually what people were seeing was the glowing of the Holy Ghost. You fast forward a few years after that, you get into the Leonard Graven Hills and you get into the, the, Benny Graham, the Billy Grahams and then you fast forward a little bit you get into the Brother Coles and, and to the uh, A.A. Allens and R.A. West and R.W. R. Shambox and then you fast forward and now you're into 1995 the Brownsville Revival yes, sir. why are you telling us all this Brother Sean? well I'm going to tell you why because it hinged revival hinged the move of God hinged on people being hungry it hinged more on the people being hungry it hinged on people being honest with God. And I hear in the church we gripe too much about whether someone's hair is long enough or their dress is long enough or whether they're wearing pants in the church or whether someone's preaching something we like or not. Listen, I ain't got time to worry about no one else. I got to worry about myself. Amen. You can get mad at me. You can like it. You can love it. I, I just tell you the truth. And if you don't like it, you can just turn me off and uh, turn the deaf ear to it. But, but it's the truth anyhow. Amen. The Bible says, seek out your own soul salvation. I ain't got time to worry about. Even though I know I'm my brother's keeper, Pastor Tanya, I still ain't got time. I got to worry about myself tonight. Amen. And you got to worry about yourself. Because at the end of the day, as the old song says, I'll stand for no one's record but my own. But my own. If you got your Bibles tonight, I'm going to go to the book of Luke. As I said a while ago, I'm, you'll, when I read these scriptures, you'll think, why in the name of God are you preaching such a thing to a house full of Christians? 
I get to take up with God. I've had this on my heart for the last few weeks. And when Pastor Timmy asked me to preach, he asked me to preach Sunday. And then he, he said, well, can you do Saturday instead of Sunday? And I said, yep. And I said, I'm ready to go with your day. He said, it don't, it don't matter to me. The book of Luke, chapter number 16. Starting at verse number 19. says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at the gate full of sores and desired to be fed with just the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes being tormented in flames and seeing, his, uh, seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou that thou in thy days or in thy lifetime receivest the good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wilt send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also uh, come to this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one be risen from the dead. And tonight, for just a few moments of your listening, if I can preach to you, I simply want to preach to you about the seven torments of hell. Pastor Dale, will you bless the Lord? Thank you, Lord. And I do thank you, Lord, for that. God, we thank you, Lord, for the presence of the Lord. God, we thank you, Lord, that you're doing things, God, in our lives that we don't even see, God, or understand, God. Thank you for everything you do, God. I ask you to touch this word because you are the word, God, that we would be a blessing, God, and to somebody else out there that needs to hear the word of God. We ask you, Lord, to bless this word as he preaches, God, and Lord, to preach the word, God, and us to receive it tonight, God, in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. I've, so, I've, said, I've said in the pulpit, and I've said in the congregation where many of you are sitting tonight, and, and I've heard preacher after preacher over the years come into the church and uh, I've heard preachers preach about how that, that we just don't hear about hell being preached in the house of God like we once used to. And uh, I've been among souls that have said in the crowd and I've said amen to that. Yet as a preacher, I have never tried to find anything on hell to preach about. I'm just going to tell on myself and, and if you can like me for my telling on me, then great. And if you can't, well, then we'll pray after I'm done. But but I have been a preacher that Pastor Timmy, I have got in pulpits and, and, and I have tried preaching things that I thought would be suitable to the crowds. I have tried, Brother Hunter, to preach things that I thought that would not have us had apple carts. I have preached things that where I've tiptoed around subjects to not make friends and family members mad at me. I have, I have got in the pulpit and, and left from the pulpit knowing God has spoke things to say what minister and say no God I can't say that because this one will get mad or that one will get mad and well the reality is is that I will stand in judgment for doing those things amen but you know what I told the Lord the other night when he gave me this message brother Timmy I said I will no longer be a man that stands in the pulpit to preach amen to what people want to hear I will no longer be a man that will stand in the pulpit brother Hunter amen to do amen I will never post get mad at me for telling you the truth 
sir. And you talk about the difference between two places. At one place I went to, there was a 79-year-old man that I've known all my life. And I'm 37. Clay now, he used to be my barber. He used to cut my hair. We was good friends. I mean, every time we seen each other out, we'd talk, we'd speak. But the thing that was about this man is he never knew the Lord. As long as I know him, Brother Hunter, he never prayed. He never talked about Jesus. And I'm telling you, I sat at that funeral home, at Jerry Stafford's funeral home yesterday, as the preacher was up preaching. And he was preaching this man into heaven. And I hope and pray to God that on his deathbed he did get saved. I knew pray to God that he got things right with God. But I sat in the back of that funeral home. And I was, I was, I was, I was corrected by the Lord and the Holy Ghost because God reminded me of how many times me and this man had interactions. How many times we had talked. And I'm the first time that I let my light shine to say, hey, brother, have you considered your ways? Hey, brother, have you got saved? Hey, brother, has anybody talked to you about the goodness of God and what God has done for you? And because I did, that man's blood could be on my hands because I never witnessed to him. Well, that's pretty, pretty, that's pretty powerful preaching, brother. Well, I tell you what, church, that's just how it is these days because if we ain't going to be the light, who is going to be? If we ain't going to be the witness, who is going to be? Many of you are older than the Lord than me. And 
And I have heard stories of the revivals, the great revivals of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and even the early 90s of, of how ministers come through. And, and Brother Sam, they come in and they preach. They preach hell. They preach fire. They preach heaven sweet and hell hot. And they say, you know, the preach is so hot, Brother Timmy, that you can feel hell underneath your feet, that you can feel hell on the seat you sit on. And many of the people that saved you tonight have said that you got saved because, you know what, you heard of hell, you sing of hell, you about hell, and therefore you knew you didn't want to go to hell. But yet somewhere along the lines, I'm going to hit on our ministers for a minute. It was this life. But then on the other hand, there was the rich man. And the Bible says, in verse number 23, it said, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosoms. Or in his bosom, should I say. Can I tell you the first torment of hell that we'll experience if we go there? We'll be able to see We'll still have eyesight. The Bible says that he opened his eyes, being in torments. S. Being more than one. Being in torments. Can I tell you a lot of people live this life thinking that? Dying is it. Dying's all you're ever going to do. And they don't think, you know, that there's a heaven and they don't think there's a hell. I honestly believe there's a lot of people that sit in the church house, maybe not this church house, but in churches across America and across the world, that I believe that they honestly think that dying is it, that there is no heaven, there is no hell. And the only reason they're coming to church is because it's just out of vain reputation. But I want to tell you, friend, tonight we need to understand that dying is only the beginning, especially if we end up in hell. Can you imagine? We've lived life. I said a while ago, soon to be 25 years I've been in church. Got saved at the age of 12. Many of you are in this older than I am. Pastor Tim, can you imagine? Dying tonight. And I ain't saying you're going to hell. Please don't think that. But, but can you imagine dying tonight and in hell lifting up our eyes? Can you imagine? Please understand, I'm not saying anybody in this church is dying and going to hell. I'm just preaching to you what God's given me to preach. You'll not only see those around you. The Bible talks about how that there's weeping and and, and, and gnashing of teeth, and I'll get into that here a little bit later. But 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 you know what? I believe in hell with your sight. You know what? You'll see the devil. You'll see demons. Amen. You'll you'll see you'll see. Amen. People that's done that and gone on before you. Amen. There's people down there. Uh, you know the Jeffrey Dahmers and and, and, and the Charles Mansons and, and and all these you know horrible horrible people that's come along. They're down there. You'll see them. You'll not only see them around you, but you know what? You'll be able to see in heaven too. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that. The Bible said he did. The Bible says that he looked afar off and he seen Abraham. And he seen Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the torment of being in hell? Brother Timmy, no, but you know what? Here you were, you had your chances, you had your opportunities. And then you look over as if, if, as if hell is not bad enough. But then you look over and there you see. You see heaven. You see God. You see the angels. You, you see the streets of gold. You see, you see the gates of pearl. You, you see, you see all the things that we've ever heard about. And knowing you could have had it. Yeah. But you missed it for what? I heard a preacher say one time. And I don't know that it was the right way to say it, but he said it anyway. He said, What in hell do you want? And it's a question to ask ourselves tonight. What is in hell that we want, church? The Bible says, the Bible says that there was a second torment. The Bible says that there was the torment of crying. Amen. 
Amen. Here it was, the Bible talks about how the verse 24, it says, He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. You see, he seen where Abraham was and he seen where, where Lazarus was, but he knew where he was and he knew the, the torments that he was in. And here he is, he's crying and he's, he's pleading with Abraham and he's saying, have mercy on me. Please have mercy. Please spare me. Please save me. But I'm telling you, no matter how much he cried, no matter how much he called, no matter how much he begged, no matter how much he pleaded, there was no more mercy. There
was going on. He asked, he asked Abraham, he said, let Lazarus just, just a dip, just a dip. Just, just let it go and put his finger. Yeah. Just, let, let, just let the tip up and touch my tongue. Because I am tormented. He just wanted one drop. I mean, that one drop right there don't do enough to satisfy my thirst that I've got right now. Yeah. That one drop right there, Timmy, it don't do nothing for me. And that's what that man was oh, begging for. Yeah. That's what that man was asking for. Oh. Just one drop. Just one drop of water. Yeah. I just want one drop. But you know what I said? All he needed was truly one drop of the blood of Jesus on his life. Yeah. And he could have mixed that man up. Oh, he oh. was in Europe right there. Now because he never asked for the drop of the blood, now he's asking for the drop of the water. And he can't get the drop of the water because there's such a great God. Come on. Yeah. Come on now. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. You think you've been thirsty before? Let me tell you. You get in hell. You'll be just like that rich man. Just one drop. Just one drop. Just give me a drop. Just one drink. That's all I want. You gotta get it, man, Timmy. You gotta get it. The torment of thirst. Can I tell you that for 2,000 years, I believe that rich man has been pleading for just that one drop. Just that one drop. For 2,000 years, he's been pleading and saying that I'm still thirsty. Still, just, just give me some sense, somebody. Just give me that one drop. Look at just for just that one drop. Yeah. And not been able to receive it. Church, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be there. No. I don't want to be that way. I don't want to experience that. You know what the reality is? Is all the money in the world that he had. All, all the fine linen that he had, all, everything that he owned, he could have he could offer it up to Abraham, he could offer it up to whoever. Amen. But it would never have made a difference. Amen. Hey, all the money, all the silver, all the gold will never be able to touch. Amen. What your soul needs, amen, through Jesus. Amen. It'll never be able to touch, amen, what we're experiencing tonight. All the money he owned, the rich man would give. For just one drop of water. The fourth torment. Is your memory. He remembered. He remembered. The Bible says that. Verse 24 I read with you. He said cried. He said Father Abraham. He said have mercy. Send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember? Can I tell you in hell we'll have our memory? Brother Tim, we'll have our memory of every church service yeah. we've ever had. Oh, absolutely. We'll absolutely. have our memory of every sermon that's ever been preached. Yeah. We'll have our memory of every song. It's ever been sung. Yeah. We'll have our memory of every time that someone tried to encourage us and tell us that we can make it. We'll have our memory of tell, having someone say, Oh, if you'll just live right, if you'll just do right, if you'll just dedicate yourself to God, if you'll just get on fire, God, if you'll just make God number one in your life. Hey, I'll tell you what, everything that we've ever done was an honor word. Everything that we ever done was just a passing word. We'll remember. Single word from every single person and every single body that tried to tell us and warn us and correct us and help us and lead us and will say, Oh God, why did I listen? We'll say, Oh God, why did I do what they said? Oh God, why? Oh God, why did I do what they said? Oh God, why? Remember every song. Remember every person. Remember every altar call. The biggest lie I've ever heard in church is when preachers, pastors across America are giving altar calls. We say within ourselves, well, I can't go to the altar and pray. He's a 
inviting a sinner man. He's inviting a sinner woman. Now, I'll tell you something. The Bible says we have this false misconception that we're secure and that we're all right. That ain't what the Bible says. The Bible says those that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. I get a lot of people give me crazy looks when I say I ain't saved yet. I'm striving to be, but I ain't there yet because my race ain't done. I ain't endured to the end. But if I endure to the end, if I hold on,
We've had too many preachers that come in and tickle our fancy and tickle our ears and tickle everything else. And we hoop and we holler and we run, we run, we, run, we swallow and we do all these things that make our flesh feel good. But we don't even get five minutes down the road and we're tormented by the devil, we're troubled by the devil. Amen. I would rather have someone come in giving me a word that's going to stir my soul and stir my spirit. Amen. And have me look at myself and evaluate me and who I am and where I'm going. Amen. Amen. Yeah. They don't even compare. 
does not compare to what hell will be like. You know what troubles me? It's no through the reading of the scriptures. <coughs> the Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. It lets me know, the Bible lets me know that hell, the borders of hell, are enlarging themselves daily. I don't want to be the man, and I hope you don't want to be the man or the woman that spends our life in church thinking we're doing God a service, thinking we're doing good for God, thinking that we're right, thinking that we're covered by the blood to only deceive ourselves. Yeah, it full of And that's the sad reality is that hell is full of I talked to a man just, just Thursday. I've known this man. I've been in EMS for about 14 years, and I've known this man for 14 years, and I never knew him to be a, a religious man, uh, a Christian man. And he came to me, ran to me, actually. His name is Sean. My name's Sean. So the two Seans was together. Right. And uh, he come running right to me, and he said, Sean! He said, Sean! He said, this Sean's got great news. I said, well, what's that? He said, I got a secret about that. And I looked at him and I said, well, how's that great news? He said, I didn't finish. He said, in a helicopter flying to St. Mary's. He said, I had fluid on the brain. He said, from blood pressure issues. He said, some things went wrong. He said, on a helicopter flying to St. Mary's, laying flat on my back. He said, looking straight up into the sky. He said, I called on God. He said, I got a saint. He said, and you know what? He said, guess what? I said, what? He said, I'm still saved. And I said, praise God. And he said, you want to know what else? I said, what? He said, I tell everybody, I'm not going to hell. He said, but rather I'm walking on hell. And I said, yeah, man, that's what I'm talking about because I just heard Pastor preach on the previous day about how he's going to stomp all over hell. Amen. I tell you, though, there are people, there are people that, like Clayton said, they thought they did well. Yeah. They thought they was doing well. Coming to church. I've heard the pastor say it so many times here lately. Be sure your sins will find you out. Your secret sins will be brought to light. They had their secret sins, Brother Tim. And they went home and they did their things. Whatever their things may be, whether it's drinking beer, doing drugs, watching porn, whether it was out here talking about people, whether it was out here, you know, I mean, whatever the case may be, I mean, you know, I don't know what they was doing, but you know what? Their secret sins, if they had any, they found them out. Because in hell, when they die, they lift up their eyes. Can I tell you tonight, though? I'm soon come close. There's something worse than going to hell. And I know many of us would say, what could be worse than end up in hell? Imagine being in hell. Imagine it's dark. You hear him weeping. Here's the thing you got to remember. In hell, you ain't the only one that's there. Yeah. You ain't the only one crying out. You ain't the, it's constant screams, constant moans, constant groans. No risk at all. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being a mom or a daddy? And all of a sudden, hearing your baby cry to you. Hey, Daddy, I followed your footsteps. Look where I'm at now. Why didn't you warn me, Daddy? Why didn't you tell me, Daddy? Tim, can you imagine if you got out of church and Clayton followed you out of church and you both died and went to hell? Can you imagine him saying, Hey, Dad, why did we quit church for? Why did we quit God? If we don't quit, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be experiencing this. Could you imagine? Hey, now, could you imagine if you got out of here and stayed out of church when you was out for a while and you not come back and you died in your shack and your kids 
there's people in hell that's experiencing that right now. So my question to you tonight is, how bad do you want it? We've heard that statement before. Now it rings true the 